So, so welcome everybody to this session on how open is open. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, it's about how to be and stay open and how um, open print principles can support that aim. So we're actually moving away from the principles, but moving into the implementation of those principles. And we're not going to get, get hung up on the details of principles today. Um, but, you know, I think we can all agree that uh, open principles are a really important standard setting instrument. We've also got uh, one of the fathers of the most important open principles with us today, Cameron. So, um, so we will touch on that, but it's particularly really talking about uh, in practice, what does it mean to be open and what are also some of the challenges with that. Um, it's also about starting a conversation to get more infrastructure to think about how they can become more open so that we have a more sustainable and equitable interconnected uh, open research ecosystem. Um, and we've got some really great uh, good practices uh, with us today uh, on our panel. Um, before I introduce you to them, uh, I want to also thank um, the Open Society Foundation, um, who has funded a lot of work that we've been doing in this area, uh, we've, uh, which Bianca will also be reporting on, and we've also been working with IOI on this. Um, so, so the panelists we have today, we have um, Ariana Bessaril, who's the Executive Director of uh, Redelic. Welcome. Uh, we've got Jeffrey Builder, who's the Director of Technology and Research at Crossref. Great that you could also make it. Lars Björnshauger, uh, old friend, well, less old, but good long-standing friend and colleague, managing director of DOAJ. Um, we've got Matt, Matt Bowes from, um, who is the executive director of DataSite. And of course, we've got Cameron, who has two hats, as, uh, as I said, the father of open uh, principles, but particularly also uh, representing Koki today um, from Curtin University. Um, so I think, um, right, and, and it's actually uh, myself, so I'm the director of Spark Europe and Bianca uh, Kramer from Utrecht University. We're organizing the session today. Um, I'd like, uh, next slide please, Bianca. Yeah, so it's now over to Bianca to, um, answer some of these critical questions before we get into the juiciness of the session um, and really looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation Bianca over to you thanks thanks Vanessa yeah I just want to quickly uh, present a few things to get the conversation starting uh, focusing on work that has been done recently not only uh, designing principles and discussing principles but really looking uh, more into making those uh, operationalize them, implement them, and, and really seeing how different uh, infrastructures and tools and services um, meet those principles. So in this discussion, there's often, even before we start looking at, at all the how this works in practice, there's also often discussion about, okay, but then what is infrastructure? Or what is open? Or which principles are we talking about? As Vanessa said, we don't want to get hung up in this session about those discussions uh, per se, but I do want to address it at some point, uh, a little bit, specifically what it is when we talk about infrastructure, because I know opinions differ and I just want to recognize that. Uh, I put up the definition from, uh, from IOI itself that uh, defines infrastructures as the set of services, protocols, standards and software that the academic ecosystem needs to, in order to perform its function throughout the whole research life cycle. And that also perhaps highlights the question, does infrastructure include the wide variety of tools and services and platforms throughout the research cycle? Or do we consider infrastructure more narrow as those uh, that critical sort of underlying infrastructure that is involved with uh, providing storage, providing identifiers, providing linkages? And we can have a whole session about that probably, but perhaps the most more interesting question, at least for me, is whether, the, whether any principles for open infrastructure are relevant for all those tools, services, and platforms when you consider them in a bit more broader sense. And 
that might be interesting to also uh, cover in the in the discussion later. I hope they are. I personally think they are. So, um, and I think in this session we also want to take that a bit broader view on on infrastructure. So principles. The first one, the first set of principles, and actually uh, while you were talking, Vanessa, it made me realize we've got two of the founders of the principles of open scholarly infrastructure here today because Jeffrey is also wearing a double hat in that sense. Uh, they're, they're perhaps the most well known. They've recently also gotten a new home uh, just for the principles themselves with their own persistent identifier and um, so in the hope that, that more people will actually use them. Uh, but there are more there are more sets. Um, Spark North, uh, North America and Car together sort of translated those principles into uh, a set of principles that are perhaps a bit more uh, operational. Op well, you, that you can operationalize a bit more. I can never say that word. There's the values and principles framework from Edicopia that Catherine Skinner also talked about yesterday. Uh, Amelica put out their principles and values specifically aimed at open access uh, publishing. So there's a, and this is only a subset of principles. So a lot of work has been done and thinking has gotten into in thinking about values and principles. But what I find really exciting that over the last couple of months maybe, I think we've really seen a shift in uh, people actually starting to apply those principles and checking their own infrastructure against those principles. We started with, uh, with Crossref and Dryad um, that publicized and made public how they considered their infrastructure to hold up against the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And I think that's really opening a conversation and makes it really like actionable. So I think that that's really cool. And uh, I also want to briefly address, uh, as a segue into the rest of the conversation, some findings from the, um, the Spark Europe report uh, on scoping open science infrastructure landscape in Europe, where, uh, which I myself also collaborated on as a disclaimer, together with Vanessa, uh, where we surveyed, uh, in the end, 120 platforms, tools and services um, that serve a variety of functions. So discovery, hosting, archiving, preservation, creation, evaluation, and publishing. And um, we try to survey a number of characteristics of these, um, these infrastructures or of these platforms, tools, and services, including how they operate their financial sustainability, a lot of things. But today I wanna focus on what we also ask them, namely using the, uh, the Spark Core good practice principles to hold themselves against those principles to see to do some sort of self assessment a lot less a lot less structured than for instance what Crossref and Dwyer did but to hold themselves against those principles and sort of self evaluate where they stood in in meeting them on their way to openness and also to identify some of the challenges they face and i think the results were very interesting if when we ask them, okay, how far along are you on the path to open relating to these principles, and also giving them these principles, of course, then uh, quite a lot of them consider themselves mature in how far they were. And um, of course, that begs the question, to what extent is that truly the case? But it also uh, points to a sense of optimism and a sense of motivation to actually meeting those principles, which I find quite encouraging. And uh, you can also see that uh, the ones people were most comfortable about and more, more, most confident in that they were meeting those principles were for open content, open standards, um, fair data collection uh, is oft sometimes misunderstood. And the ones that are most difficult for people uh, perhaps are good governance and succession planning. We also ask them to identify challenges, specific challenges that their infrastructure or their tool or service was facing in, in meeting those principles. And uh, that resulted in um, answers from, well, these are the number of respondents that answered uh, with a challenge in any of these areas. I just want to briefly mention some of them. Um, for instance, for, for good governance, um, things, areas that people identified as challenges were 
how to organize uh, decision making to make that sound, to make that equitable, to make that relevant for the community, how to balance different, um, different interests from different type of stakeholders in your governance, how to achieve um, sufficient representation in your governments. Uh, there was a challenge for both uh, small, small organizations to organize that and to envision what good governance could be, but also for bigger organizations, the challenge was often in, uh, in coordination and again in meeting different interests of different stakeholders. And throughout all the principles, there was often a lack of resources, be that either time or money or expertise to work on, uh, on meeting those principles or to work towards openness. Because that does require time, it does require money, it does require expertise. Um, open content, I won't cover all of them, I'll just cover three of them. And the open content is the second one, the second most often mentioned uh, area for challenges. Um, providing actual open content. I think we're all familiar with those challenges. Um, to some extent, it depends on the policies of other content providers for those infrastructures that uh, don't, that provide access to content of others. Um, but also when it's their own content or they control the content, it raises questions of copyright on licensing. And uh, also an area people are having difficulty with difficulty with its completeness and quality of metadata, either providing good quality metadata or having to deal with metadata from other uh, services they use that perhaps are incomplete or lack quality. And the final example, uh, the open standards. Uh, this principle sort of brought together issues around open APIs, um, open standards and using open source code. And challenges, well, top on the list here was really the lack of resources, but also quite interesting, uh, both challenges in using other people's APIs uh, due to changes in that, uh, due to uh, incompatible standards, due to different data formats. Uh, but at the same time, while they identify challenges in using other people's uh, uh, data or APIs from other infrastructures, also for themselves, questioning the value of the, or the return on investment in of investing in open source and open APIs. So there's really a tension there uh, from think from a perspective as a data provider or from the perspective of a data user. And to sort of build on that, uh, I wanted to end with, uh, with this image where um, because I think it highlights the importance of, of what we're talking about. Uh, this reflects the results when we asked uh, those services that in our survey, which other services they are dependent on, and then map that as a network analysis. So you can really see that there are some, some services, Coshev among them, Orkut among them, DRJ among them, based that are open air, that are really central in this ecosystem of, um, of open science. And I think that highlights both the importance and in addition that many of these central infrastructures are nonprofit infrastructures. So I think this highlights the importance of why providing open metadata, uh, using open source, providing open data is really important to enable a healthy working ecosystem. So it's really worth working towards. And I hope this will sort of set the scene and provide enough uh, material for discussion with our panel who all represent infrastructures and who can, uh, from their own experience, uh, reflect on, on their good practices and their challenges in their path towards openness. Thank you very much for making such a lovely bridge, uh, Bianca. So to over to the panelists now. So. Um, so I would really like to uh, ask the panel um, a couple of questions. Um, and um, the first one being, so for your infrastructure or service, what does it really mean to be open in practice? So what are you doing to be open, but also what are the challenges that come with that? Um, and I'd like to ask Ariana to answer first. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you very much. Uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here. Uh, well, uh, for us, um, well, Redelic uh, has been driven since its creation uh, 18 years ago. I, I'm sorry, but I, how, uh, how much time do I have to answer? Three minutes. Okay. Have three minutes, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
um, uh, well, uh, since its creation 18 years ago by a strong and natural commitment of support the science as commons approach with the corresponding principles and values uh, being, uh, being that it began in the Latin American region where science has been considered a public good. Uh, however, it was until 2016 that joined with various allied stakeholders through the AMELICA initiative that we made uh, our principles and core values more explicit uh, due to a context of distortion and undermining of the non-commercial ecosystem uh, of the scholarly communication in the region. So we believe that um, unless open infrastructures or service providers have a clear mission based on principles and their agendas, governance uh, structures and funding, funding models are aligned to such principles, their efforts will be ensured to serve their mission. So uh, the link between values and principles should be uh, operationalized. Inclusion and equity, for example, uh, which are key values in our approach, uh, are operationalized in our criteria, for example. Those the concept of APC, which tacitly causes exclusion for less resource authors, uh, is operationalized in our criteria. We implemented non-APC as a compulsory requirement for the journalists who want to be part of Reda League, for example. So our principles uh, were settled to ensure that open access, that the open access approach that enables academia-owned, non-commercial and non-subordinated scholarly communication is strengthened. In this sense, both our governance model and our funding strategies are, uh, are designed to prevent our services to be utilized by commercial open access or to serve to commercial interests. Principles also help uh, our community to be aware of different positions and to be more critical and reflexive on how um, every step we take as a community impacts in the future uh, of open. So to think uh, what, is, what is needed to ensure that open remains open. Uh, and principles also have an incidence in the community, um, in the community dynamics, let's say and the potential to guide actions towards a shared goal. So this is how we, uh, we have leveraged our principles and values to achieve our mission, to provide services to uh, Diamond Open Access and uh, particularly to Academy and Diamond Open Access, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariana. Uh, Cameron, how, um, how open is Koki and what are the challenges? I know you're exploring some of these things right now and, and having discussions with the community, but could you also, uh, within three minutes, if you can, uh, tell us, um, yeah, where you are open, where it's easier to be open and where it's perhaps not so easy. And, and of course, it's quite hard because you're the one, as I say, one of the fathers of those principles. So, um, yeah, over to you. Yeah, so, I mean, Koki stands for the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative. It started as a research project. Um, and we've realised it needs to become an infrastructure or infrastructural to realise its goals. So the principles principles in general and values statements serve two functions for us at the moment, really an aspiration, a root, uh, things we're not doing yet. And I wouldn't claim that we're doing very many of the things in the principles um, that Jeffrey and I and Jennifer wrote at all at the moment, but we can see them as a list of things to do. And we can see the value in being held to account against those principles over time, in part because of what Ariana says, that this is all about building community um, and sharing and expressing those shared values. Um, so I guess we can talk more about the, the nitty gritty of, of the goals and how that plays out in practice as we go. But I think for, for Koki itself, it's a set of aspirations that we want to work towards um, and, you know, the easy stuff, as, as Bianca said, uh, we can make the code available. Um, we're looking at how to make the data uh, we have more available and more useful, um, but we're a long way from governance and financial sustainability um, and all of those things. Those are the, the hard bits that will take work. Um, but we expect all of you to hold, hold us to account against those in the future. Knife, Raphael Warnock once stepped on a crack in the sidewalk. Raphael okay, what's that? Uh 
uh, we should I, you be worried? No. no, I don't think so. I think it's no, just... okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being a bit too nervous, yeah. I think, because of what no, just was, happened. I think it was Luke with some stereo on, I hope. Go on. Okay, so um, Lars, what about DOAJ? I, you have really grown over the years. Can you tell us about your um, your openness in practice and also some of the challenges? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, all what we do is supposed to be uh, relevant for uh, basically uh, the globe. Uh, so, so one of uh, one of the challenges there is to uh, uh, actually uh, being able to translate as much information as possible, uh, and and that uh, requires resources, of course. Um, we have uh, all the way had uh, had the policy that our services should be should be free uh, for everyone. Um, from the outset, uh, we have tried to uh, develop our software in such a way that it was open, documented, and uh, available nowadays on, on, on GitHub. Uh, I've been very inspired of, uh, of the document uh, provided by, by Jeffrey and Lynn and, and Cameron. And, and there's one word there uh, which I found very interesting, namely fork ability. Uh, the fact that uh, your service, your software should be able to be picked up by another organization in case of a disaster or, or winding down and so. so. So that has been very important for us to set up uh, not only uh, the software, uh, but as well to comply to standards and stuff, and as well to uh, be sure that uh, our uh, the way we organize uh, the service uh, is uh, in a way that it is protected from being taken over by corporate companies. Uh, DOAJ is uh, operated by Infrastructure Services for Open Access, which is a community interest company based in the UK. And uh, we actually have in our statutes that in case of termination or winding up, uh, all the assets should go to a, an organization with a similar mission. So that, that's another important part of uh, openness. Uh, our challenge uh, challenges is, um, I think, of course, uh, the, the financial issues, but uh, it has uh, been improving a lot uh, since SCOS, of course, but uh, it is as well uh, to uh, to handle the governance issues. A lot of different stakeholders, uh, we have more than 500 contributors. How do we set up a thing uh, that will really allow for all stakeholders to contribute and how do you allow for uh, sort of global diversity in, in, in any way? So we are, um, we have gone part of the way and uh, we have a council and the, uh, advisory board, 200 uh, institutions and publishers has participated in the first round of nominations and voting, and we will have to extend that to all our contributors. So, uh, so governance for a small organization with that many stakeholders is, uh, is a challenge. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Lars. Um, what about Matt and uh, DataSight? Where are you with openness and also the, some of the challenges of following open principles? Yeah, thanks. Um, let me know if my connection's a bit unstable. It says every now and then that it's unstable. I'll turn off the video if it is. Um, I think picking up on some of the things that were mentioned already, one of the key things is translating these principles that are really, I, I guess, aspirations that we can hold ourselves to um, into operational day-to-day -day activities um, to deliver this openness to the community. And so um, from a data side perspective, uh, we launched in 2009 and our model was to set up uh, a general assembly, um, which is every member globally across 43 countries that has um, a voting right in the association and is the overarching governance 
um, layer in our governance strata. Um, but I think what's really important is then uh, looking deeper into that governance strata, what are those structures that we have within the organization? And so that's something that we've tried to do is have the board and underneath the board, we have steering groups with very clear terms of reference and um, what they are set out to do. And then also looking at various expert groups and focus groups that are set up in the different regions, um, because it's really important that um, we don't lose sight of, I guess, trying to open up and make sure that governance is all open and that we still can actually do things and have focus within the various groups and coordinate effectively. Um, I think it's important to evaluate this continually as infrastructure grows. Um, data site has had a lot of transitions over the years. And so it's always good to take time to reflect and, and reevaluate. And it's really nice to see the principles now that have, I guess, been given new life um, in the form of a, uh, a website that we can all look to aspire to these and also look to, to evaluate and, and look at how we can um, align with these um, I think the insurance piece is really important in openness. So open data at data sites, our data file is CC0 um, and also open source codes. Um, our code is all um, open under an MIT license. Um, I think maybe also to mention that um, the focus should be on providing tangible services. The data is a community asset. Um, so we shouldn't focus on just making data open. It, it's, it's really about the services and making those tangible, valuable services to the community. Um, and then I think Lars also mentioned a bit about um, costs, which I think is also something important in openness is that um, as you open up infrastructure, it's important to implement a scalable model for cost recovery over time. And so I, I mentioned cost recovery because that's a very uh, clear focus is that it's really about covering those costs and delivering value, as much value as possible with the resources that you have available. Um, and then also providing various mechanisms to ensure that um, the infrastructure is a going concern, um, but as well as um, putting in place wind down mechanisms. Um, so should something happen to the infrastructure, what are those mechanisms and triggers that would happen? So that ensures that um, continued persistence um, of, of the infrastructure that is set up. Um, I'll also mention that that's data site that I've just spoken about. Um, and I'll quickly mention that um, this also applies to um, initiatives such as RAW. Um, RAW is not an organization. Um, data sites, um, Crossref and CDL are the governing organizations of RAW. And we've set out um, and will be publishing very shortly, I think, Maria is working on the post and I'm sure she'll post it in the Slack channel about how RAW aligns with the principles. Um, and that's also important that um, we can set up these new initiatives also um, aligning with some of these principles. Thank you, Matt. Uh, last but not least, so Jeffrey um, at Crossref, you've done a, quite a bit of work uh, recently. Can you share with us uh, some of the highlights of that? <clears throat> Sure. So, <clears throat> so I, I, I probably wear three hats here. Uh, one is as one of the three authors of, of the principles um, for open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, the other is as a sort of crossref, um, uh, as, a, as a person, representative crossref. And then the third is having been involved in the spinning out of um, now two other organizations, uh, the first being ORCID and the second uh, being ROAR, uh, which Matt just mentioned. Um, but I'll start with just Crossref. I mean, it is, you know, Crossref is just this year uh, self-described as an open scholarly infrastructure organization. Um, and, uh, and of course, we just made the announcements about, um, about adopting and endorsing the principles uh, a few weeks ago. And that might surprise a lot of people because, um, because I've talked about open scholarly infrastructure for a while, um, but Crossref itself never described itself that way. Um, now I've maintained that it, it has essentially been open scholarly infrastructure, um, but it was accidentally so. Um, it, was, it was sort of, when it was founded, right? Um, the term open probably wasn't nearly as contentious as it, it, um, it became. 
Um, and now, of course, the term is probably becoming less contentious since virtually all publishers are, um, are, are becoming open access, uh, whether they like it or not. But in the early days when Crossroof is founded, it was founded by um, fierce competitors, people who didn't trust each other as far as they could throw each other. Um, and so uh, when Crossroof was founded, um, uh, because they, they knew they were found, founding infrastructure, and this gets to the definition of infrastructure that you were talking about, right? Infrastructure is um, by definition, something that is going to be, that lots of people are going to depend on, that lots of people have to participate in, in order for it to become infrastructure. And with that comes systemic risk, right? If it fails, um, that, uh, that puts everybody who is invested in it or who uh, has become dependent on it at risk. And so the founders of Crossroof were very interested in making sure that it couldn't be co-opted um, by one of their competitors. So whether it had anything to do with being open or not, it had to do with self-protection. Um, and so um, a lot of the principles that Crossroof were founded was found, you know, have, that Crossroof has used but never really articulated or, 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 or written down, you know, have, were key to its success. So things like, um, you know, making sure that everybody had an equal vote, uh, making sure that um, our operations were transparent, uh, making sure that, um, and this is something that I don't think was mentioned in the survey that, you, that, that, that was conducted that, that Bianca covered at the beginning, but that we were sustainable. Uh, that you know that it that we weren't entirely dependent on any one particular party. These things um, these things were really designed to protect everybody uh, who participated in Crossref, whether they were an open access publisher or 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 not. Um, it turns out that those principles uh, you know are, are I think probably quite portable and do apply to a lot of things. Anybody who is uh, committing to use a tool that affects so many people and that could have such a, uh, uh, you know, and that could be so, that could have such a profound negative effect if it, if it stopped working or if it got taken over by somebody who had, um, who had motivations that were different than the communities. Well, all of the principles that we've, we've built are designed to, to, to sort of mitigate that and to help um, make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so, so Crossref has sort of ironically followed lots of these principles, but never had them written down. Now it's gotten them written down. And I think writing them down, and I think that publishing them and committing to them is important. It was certainly important to the founding of ORCID, right? Um, because uh, we couldn't get, you know, when we were trying to create ORCID as a Crossref organ or service, Lots of people said, hey, this is very risky having so much infrastructure and the power of one group, you know, in the in sort of being managed by one group. We want to found, found another organization that that actually enshrines the principles that Crossref has maybe operated under uh, informally, uh, so that people can be sure that um, that the decisions that the you know that the that the board makes align. With the, with the interests of the community. And so when ORCID was launched, it launched a set of principles that it, and it didn't meet any of them, right? But the point of launching with those principles was that it short-circuited a lot of decisions and a lot of uh, things that the board had to decide. When the board was sitting down and deciding, you know, what is our sustainability model going to be? It immediately meant that there were certain sustainability models they couldn't consider and they had to look for uh, others. It meant that you know when they were thinking about the governance, they had to adopt certain uh, uh, you know uh, certain standards. So, so I think that it would probably have been a lot easier for Crossref if we had adopted uh, formalized those principles at the beginning, um, because we had lots of sort of circular conversations at various points in time. Uh, now that we have adopted them, I think that. It will make conversations about what we can and can't do a lot easier. Um, and I certainly advise uh, any organization that's thinking of starting an infrastructure um, and any other sort of early infrastructure organizations to adopt these principles because I do think that they help. 
right? They will make the process of decision-making more efficient and, and quicker. Thanks a lot, uh, Jeffrey. This might actually be a very nice bridge to uh, to open the floor for questions. We're a bit limited in that we don't have chat. So I would really like to invite people to be less shy than normally on meetings and just unmute and ask any question that, uh, that you want to ask of any of our speakers or share your own experiences. I have a question. How important is democratic control by the users or is it okay for a small little group of um, of directors to control the outcomes of organizations. Anyone from the panel who'd like to I, answer I that? can take a first crack at that, because um, this is, um, I think, a theme, and I think Ariana may, may well follow on from this, but um, it's important. The first principle of getting something done is that you exist. Um, if you don't exist, if, and if you're not doing anything, then you're not doing anything. So there's a tension here, right? There's a tension between having everyone involved in every conversation and having power concentrated in the hands of a few. I think the, the point we've really focused on, and this was very much Jeffrey's point in the principles, is trustworthiness. You have to earn that trust um, over time. You have to signal that you're still worthy of retaining that trust. Um, and there's lots of mechanical things you can do to help with that. Um, but, uh, but you've got to be actively engaged in, even if it is the decisions are being made by a relatively small group, that group has to be engaging with community, has to be drawing in opinions, has to be seen to be um, taking those things on board. There's a reason why we didn't specify mechanisms in the, for governance in the principles, um, and that's because... We thought there weren't that many choices, but we didn't think we had all the answers. Um, but I think it's it's just a tension, um, and you've really got to work at it. That's that's the point. All of these things, um, and again, Jeffrey's post on the Crossref blog points out that these these things are intention, right? Sustainability, action, trustworthiness, governance, community. They're all things that need to be that sometimes are, are pulling in different directions. So it's really about being intentional and the point of the principles or any set of principles or value statements is to have something that people can externally hold your feet to the fire over. Um, and so you got a, a way of judging whether people are actually living up to those values or not. Um, the only thing I'd add is that of course, you know, the other thing, and this gets back to the, the uh, point that uh, Lars was making is that the notion of uh, insurance or forkability is critical here, right? So um, if it is a small, uh, smallish group, uh, the fact that if they don't carry the community along with their decisions, you know, if, if, if they don't do that, the fact that the community can take the data and the code and create something else serves to focus the mind, right? Um, and the places where we've seen you know, nonprofits or uh, or infrastructure organizations clearly diverge from the interests of the community have been places where it's been incredibly difficult to fork uh, the system. You know, things like ICANN and the trying to sell the, you know, to, to split out the dot org um, thing, you know, come to mind. Um, and, and even then, right, when the community rallied and said, hey, this is unacceptable, um, you know, they did, they did revert. Um, but having that threat of forkability um, addresses a lot of the issues of, of, about governance. And, you know, to, to, to Cameron's point, you know, it's a difficult thing. We all know that the sort of the bigger the group, the harder it is and slower it is to make decisions. And so you can get a group that becomes sclerotic, you know, just they can't do anything. Um, and, um, and at the same time, having a small group concentrates power. So, you know, that's why we did focus so much on that insurance aspect of it. Can I perhaps also, Ariana, is there, do you have anything to add to, uh, to this on the subject of decision-making? Thank you, Vinka. Yes, I, I just want to highlight the importance of uh, community-led uh, infrastructures, as well as uh, to encourage, uh, well, the community to be part in cooperative models. So. 
uh, with the, uh, there's no property of the infrastructure and th there's a distribution of responsibility and distribution of uh, decisions and distribution of power. So try to keep a balance in that is important. Thanks. We um, only I have just, a... I, sorry, I did, I did want to point out something again, because Matt had brought up Roar. Um, you know, the, one of the challenges we face when we create infrastructures and organizations is that, you know, it's often, you know, do we have to create another organization for every infrastructure that we create? Um, and are we gonna have to create a governance structure and, you know, and, and all of the apparatus that goes with that. And ROAR is an experiment to see if we can actually try and, you know, buck that trend. See if we can actually get a, a bunch of groups that themselves represent communities you know, and you know, so it's three, three groups that represent communities uh, operating another sort of uh, identifier, um, and you know, we're following the principles again. It's forkable. It's all of these things, but the idea is that you know, people have have uh, you know, uh, membership fatigue. Uh, they're they're tired of spinning up new organizations and having to create boards and all of this that goes with it. And so, if there's a way that we can actually leverage existing organizations, that's good. It does mean that, um, you know, that the, that, the, that the management of Roar at the moment is controlled by those three parties. Um, but those three parties in turn are managed by very large communities. Um, so, you know, I think this is a, an interesting experiment at the moment. Thanks. We have a challenge. We have about two minutes left. So I'm going to give back to, to Vanessa and perhaps we have a really quick question with a really quick answer challenge. To end with? I think, well, yes, I, I did have a question and it was actually for Cameron. Um, so, well, it's actually, no, it's not just Cameron, it's it's for Jeffrey, for all those involved in developing those uh, open principles. So is this what you envisioned when you established those principles, the challenges that we have uh, now? Um, so, just a few words. Yeah, you have about one minute, I think. <laughs> I, I think the problems that people are talking about and grappling with, the questions that people are asking, are the ones that we thought were important to address. Mm -hmm. Our goal, as much as anything, was to focus people's attention on it. Um, and in five years, I think people's attention has become more focused. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I've become in my old age more reflective that we make progress slowly. Um, but the fact that we're talking about it, the fact that this is, seems to be working for some people, um, perhaps the next step is more criticism and change those principles um, and adapting them and, and making them more widely useful for more different organisations. Well, I'd really love to uh, thank everybody uh, for coming. I do think it's the start of, a, of an important uh, conversation and I'd love to do more of this next year and I think we will be because we also want to stimulate others. And I think as Jeffrey said also, if you're starting out, the ideal thing is to start with some of those principles. It's going to make things easier for you along the way. So um, uh, looking forward to talking more about this important topic next year. Thank you so much for coming everybody. Thank you to our panelists, uh, really inspiring. And I think we've got some more inspiration on the way with some awards now.